Okay, so what's wrong with this? It says it identified two major flaws. There's two, two things that are wrong with this. I'm going to go ahead and trim the percentages that add up to 100. Yeah, obviously. If they're all greater than 20, then 5 times 20 is 100. Okay. So it's greater than 100. See, some of it is 124, but it should be 100. Okay. With a small possible round off here. It could be slightly less or more, but that's too, that's too, too much more. So, okay. so what else is there? says that it's from a normal distribution. So we didn't talk about that. So let me go ahead and show you what that means. These are your four typical distributions. This is the normal or bell shape. Now, what we have here is actually a discrete distribution because you have rectangles. A, a continuous distribution is just a line. Because it's, it's technically it's a sum of infinite rectangles, but you can only use calculus for. But anyway, this is fairly bell-shaped. You see the term? Right. This one is called uh, uniform because it's essentially flat. There's a little bit of variation, but it's essentially they're all equally likely. The frequencies are all the same, so they'd all be equally likely. This one has a bell shape, but it's skewed to the right. You see, it's a bigger tail on the right, so we call it skewed left. Uh -oh. This one has a tail on the left, so it's skewed left. These are your four basic shapes, although there are bimodal where you can have two humps. Yeah. There's, there's variations on stuff. But these are your basic four. So when they say something's normal, it starts low, it goes up, and it comes back down low at a high point in the middle. So this is bell shaped or normal. So on this problem here, they asked us, oh, shoot. What? Oh, God. Once we already know that the frequencies don't add up to 100 or too, too far from 100 or 124. So that's wrong. The other thing is, is that it's not bell-shaped, so it can't be a normal distribution. But that's that says the wrong thing. They says that, that says the wrong thing. Yeah, all the relative frequencies are roughly the same. They're all from the twenties. So if they're from a normal distribution, they should start low, reach a maximum, and then decrease. They should give that bell shape curve. So that's what's wrong. They're not normal. So those are the two major flaws with this frequency distribution. So that's one of the things that I always look for when we, when I get a frequency distribution handed to me is do they add up to 100% within reason? Okay, next question, number five. Okay, so here we're going to, they want us to identify the lower class limits, the upper class limits, the class width, the class midpoints, and the class boundaries. So we already talked about the limits of the width. We'll add these two as we go. So they want the lower class limit. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven boxes. They want the lower class limit. So it's 25, 35, 45, 55, et cetera. So an easy way to do this is use your tab key. 25 tab, 35 tab, 45 tab, 55 tab, 65 tab, 75 tab, and 85. Those are all the lower class limits. That's what they're asking for. Seven classes, seven lower limits. Then they want the upper class limits in ascending order. So that's the 34, 44, et cetera. So 34 tab, 44 tab, 54 tab, 64 tab, 74, 84, and 94. Those are the upper class limits. Now, as we've been doing this, can you identify the width? You weren't here before, so maybe you can't. What's the width? Remember the width? 25 to 94. No, no, the class width. The width of one class. Uh, so. How much oh, is it? Okay, here? so it would be uh, 10. 10. 
but the difference is 10. Check it out. And you can do this 25, 30, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. How many numbers are between 25 and 34? 10. That's the hard way. The easy way is just to go vertical and subtract, and you get 10. No matter what, whether you use the upper limits or the lower limits, it's always 10. And now they're going to ask us for the midpoint. Well, the midpoint is the very first formula on the, on the, on the handout I gave you. It's called mid-range or mid, midpoint. Mid, midpoint. It's the same. It's the, it's the, it's the high plus the, it's the, it's the sum of the, um, it's the sum of the values divided by two. So we take, I'll use the calculator. So I take, I take the, uh, I take the sum of 25 and 34. We're just taking the mean value. So it's 29 and a half. That's halfway. That's the midpoint for the first class. Oh, okay, so okay. that's the midpoint between 25 and 34. If, if you if you if you subtract four and a half, you get 25. If you add four and a half, you get 34. All right, so that's the first one. Now, do I have to calculate all of them? What's the easiest way for me to say what's the next midpoint? Just add 10. Just add the width. The middles have to line up, so the, the distance between the middles has to be the same as the distance between the endpoints. Easy enough. You got it. So 39 and a half. This is a lot of busy work for this uh, particular uh, type of question, but once you get it, shouldn't miss it. Straight up, straightforward. Last one's 89 and a half. So the difference is 10. See. I just, I just keep adding 10. Once I establish the first one and I know it's correct, then I just move, up, move on from there. Okay. Now the boundaries. This one I have to. For the boundaries, we're going to draw a histogram. And the, the boundaries are the numbers that are between the limits. And you can't see it on the first one, but what's the number between 34 and 35? What's halfway between them? 34.5. So what do you suppose the next limit is between 44 and 45? What did I add? 10. So these are my these are my uh, class boundaries. So when we make a drawing, oops, 54. When we make our histogram, these are our uh, these are where our vertical rectangles get their uh, edges. Now notice 94.5 is half a unit above 94. Because it's, so if I go 10 below this, what do I end up with? Half a unit below 25. So the, for the end ones, you just have to add a half and subtract a half. The middle ones are the, between the, the, the upper and lower limits for each class. So th those are the boundaries. Once again, I just I, once I get the first one, I just add 10. So 34.5, 44 44.5, 54 44.5, 64.5. Notice that these numbers are not included in the uh, data. They can't be because our data is all integers. These are not these are not possible data points because the data the data is all uh, age to the nearest year and these are to the nearest half year so they can't be data points so they won't they won't interfere with with the frequency table or the frequency diagram how many how many are in the in this uh, you can add it up fifty nine seventy three eighty eight Seventy-five, eighty-one, eighty-two, eighty-three. It's eighty-three. N is eighty-three. Look, N equals eighty-three is the sample size. So to draw the histogram, 
I can't draw. I can't use the, the software to draw because I don't have the raw data. What you do is you create a vertical axis, and we know that the largest is 32. So I'll just go 10, 20, 30, 40. We'll go by tens. So the first one is uh, 27. So 27 is about right here. The next one is 32, which is about right there. So you see, these form the, the intervals between the, the next one's 14, which is, a, which is about right there. Two, six, one, one. And then if you have room for it, then you just put in the values. You always start uh, like the first number would it always be in the descending order, or I guess ascending order. Which what would be ascending? So twenty seven that top uh, frequency is always going to be third. Well, yeah, because you're going by you're going in, oh, a, in okay. ascending I order on the that, 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 these are the x's. These represent the x's. We don't know the raw data. Those are the x's, gotcha. and these are the frequencies. Oh. Okay. Yeah. F stands for frequency. Yeah. X is the frequency. Once again, we don't know the X's. All we're saying that for this class, there's 27 of them. And the, the height gives you a feeling of how many are there. Yeah. By the way, is this is it's the right skewed yeah, right. Or the skew right. Right? Skewed right. Mm -hmm. So for the skew, uh, for if it's skewed right, does it have to have that beginning upward motion or not really? It could come down. Okay. Typically, they do go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This would be the modal class. Mode means most frequent. So this is the, that's the largest uh, frequency for a class. So this is the modal class. There's most most of them. We're gonna, we'll talk about that on Thursday. Mode, mean, median, mode are the measures of central tendency. All right, so I can't draw this one, but I will be able to draw some ones coming up. Number eight. Uh, this one's very similar to what we just did. Uh, let's just answer a couple. Well, we can. What's the what's the what's the uh, width? It's easy, huh? Well, you know, when you get from 100 yeah. to 99. Can you tell, was it skewed right, skewed left, bell shape? Skewed right. Skewed right. You see it? It goes, it goes down, up, down, and then if you if you didn't have that, it might you might cons almost consider it bell shape. It's almost bell shape, but there's there's uh you, you would probably have to create more rectangles. That maybe double the amount of of a, of a, of a class just to spread it out. See the, the open this back. Oh, they're going to just give us the uh, yeah. It doesn't help us. I can't use it. But anyway, this one would be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 lower, and then the next. So it's very similar to the one we just did. Okay, and uh, identify the number of individuals. That's for the 100 and uh, 19, 148, 49, 51, 150. Okay, so you get that? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's going to be one of yours for homework. Okay, does the frequency distribution appear to have the normal distribution? Does it start low, go high, and come back down? Yeah. Basically, there's an anomaly at the first, but I would I could live with that. So I would say yes. Let's see if they agree. No, they don't agree. They say no because of the first one being three and the second one being zero. You know, I would say it's pretty close, but they, they're being they're being really nitpicking. There's a, there's a time later on where they might change their minds, so hang, hang on to that.
we'll come back to the top. Oops, what did I do? Oh my gosh, I did. So we were on 11. Okay, now they want us to fill in the fill in the frequency. Now, I'll show you two ways to do this. And here's our first chance to learn about stat crunch. Stat crunch is our calculator inside. And, and the data, see those double rectangles? If you just go there with your left click, it says open stat crunch clipboard Excel. We want stat crunch. So here's stat crunch. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this so I can fit them here so they don't. So there's your raw data, and it is it's not it's not um, let's see what's the right word. It's not ordered from smallest to largest. It's just raw data. There's 20, 20 data points. They want us to put in the frequencies. And these these are the classes. So the width is they can tell you the width is six. See 21 minus 15 is six. That's where they got that. They tell you they're starting at 15. Okay. All right. So how do we do it? Well, you could go back there and go one at a time and put tick marks, or the easier way is just to watch this. You go to data, sort. You tell it select the column. The column is variable one. And then you go down over here and it says select column one ascending. And then just to make sure I don't make a mistake, I also always put create a new column from Q. So I don't need this. I close okay. that. So now see it says sort variable one. Now it's sorted. It's ordered from smallest to largest. So all I got to do is go over here and say, okay, up to 20.9. So I go one, two, three. It's three. So there's three. Okay, now next is uh, to up to 26.9. So that's uh, eight more. See that? Mm. Up to that one. So that's eight. The next one goes up to 32.9. So that's right there. So that's uh, five. Next one goes up to 38.9, so that's three of them, right? One, two, three. And the last one has one. And then I just add these up real quick to make sure that I have uh, 20. 11, 16, 19, 20. I got them all. See, rather than hunting and pecking and scratching and crossing out, that's why it's out. too much work. Okay, now here's another way. Because we're going to be doing this later. See where it says graph? Mm -hmm. Is this the graph? So which column? It doesn't matter. They're both the same. I'll just mm -hmm. take variable one. And then I go down here where it says bins. Bins are the same as classes. Mm -hmm. this, this uses the word bins instead of classes. Where do you start? You start at 15. And what's your width? Six. So all I, got, all I got to do with it over here is go three, eight, five, three, one. So I just hold the cursor in the, in the rectangle and it tells me the frequency. See it? Three, eight, five, one. Now, they don't put the class boundaries here. They put the limits, which is unfortunate. See, because these are supposed to be boundaries. So let me see if I can, let me see what happens if I change that. If I start this at 14.5, or no, it'll be, it'll be 14.95. Because halfway between 20.9 and 21.0 is 20.95. So this would be 14.95. Let's see what happens if I do that. There you go. See, now I have my boundaries. And if I add six, 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 
And this is 0 0.05 greater than 44.95. See that? See, the five comes in the, in the hundredth place now instead of the, the tenths because okay, right. this is where we started. In other words, halfway between these two numbers is 20.95. So this is 26.95, 32.95, 38.95. So this has to be 44.95, and this is 14.95. Now I have my boundaries, and it looks a lot better because now these none of, none of these numbers are actual data, and my bars indicate the separation between the the, the uh, classes or the this they call it bins. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's skewed right for what it's worth. Okay, so that stat crutch has a, it has a lot of power to it. Just remember that these the double rectangles are typically where you where you can load it into stat crutch. Okay, so I'm going to use stat crutch again, so I close it now. I'm going to move on to the next problem, which is uh, uh, yeah, I'll do 13. Now we have to supply the limit. They give us the starting point and they give us the width. So the easiest way to do this is to go vertical and add the width to this. So it'd be 3.230. You see that? So it'd be 3.230. I'm adding 0 0.10. So I get 2.30. 2, 2 so the next one is 3.240. See, I'm just going to do the lower lower widths first. It's just easier to understand. It's 2.250. And the last, the last one is 3.260. Now, To the nearest hundredth, this has to be 3.229. Mm -hmm. To the next number is 3.230. So this has to be 3.229 for the width to be 0 0.010. So 3.229. And then I just add the point 0, 0, 0.010, so I get 3.239. And 3.259, and finally 3.269. Okay. So now, I now this one says click on the icon to view the data. So it's a double click because I got to click that, and now it's open the stat crunch. There's my double rectangle. So I open the stat crunch. Now the data table I don't need anymore, so I close it. Now, we could do this one of two ways. We can either create the uh, histogram or we can create, a, do the sort. So let's do it backwards this time. We'll create the histogram. As long as you got raw data, you can do the histogram. Now, variable one and then my bins. I'm going to start at, once again, it's going to be 05. It's going to be 3.2205. Because this will be 3.2295 between those two. So it's going to be 3.2195, I should say. 3.2195, right? 3.2195. And then the width is 0 0.010. And let's see. I think we could just do it out of like zero. See, halfway between these two numbers right. is three point two two nine five. Because you got to, you always got to go one more decimal place than your data has. Okay. Right. So this is three decimal places. So the boundaries have four decimal places. And you can see that it makes it all. Once you get these, and now it's real easy to read the numbers. It's three, seven. 7, 11, 2. 3, 7, 7, 11, 
Okay, so the other way to do this would be to go, once again, I'll show you again, data, I'll, I'll close that, data, sort, select the column, variable one, select variable one ascending. This time I won't replace it because we, we, we know we got the right answer. So what it did, it was just, it took, it took the, a raw data and, and it automatically put it in order. So look, up to 229, there's three of them. Two, one, two, three. Up to two, two, three, nine. They're all threes at the beginning, so all I'm interested in is the, is the decimal. So two, three, nine would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Up to four, two, four, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Up to five, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then the last one has 2. So you could do it that way. But I would recommend using one or the other, whichever is easier for you. The, the graph? Well, as long as you get, you got, but you got to make sure you get the right starting point. They give you, they essentially gave us the starting point. Now, let's go back to that and let's check something. Let's see if, if, if I do it with the, with the lower boundary if it works just as well. So let's let's use the 3.220. And the width was right there it is. Yeah, it works. Great. So you can put in the lower boundary or the lower uh, lower limit, either one. Uh, is this and bar graph same thing? Bar graphs are separate. That's what I'm Histograms have to be touching the rectangles okay. touch in a bar on a bar chart, the rectangles don't touch. Okay. That's the difference. They're essentially the same thing, but just separated. they're separated. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a question. Is it? Oh, is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, because yeah, I would. I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did it, I don't. I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah All I right. wanted to make sure before I start calling it a bar graph in my head. Right. See, that's 14. That's yours. 15. Okay, here we go. It's the same thing. Uh, only I have the raw data, so I I can do it. Which would you rather me do it? You like the guys like the histogram? Yeah, All right, so I open up the data in Stat Crunch. I go to Graph Histogram Variable One and bin start at zero. Let's just let's just use the lower limit zero, and the width is. Point two, right? Yeah. See how I did that? I just went vertical. There's the width right there. There it is also. They, they actually gave it to us. But if we, even if they didn't, we could see it right there. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's all I got to do. There it is. So the first one is 24. Two. Three. I like how if you click on it, it gives you. And then zero, 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 one. And if I add those up, I get 29. No, I, I'm sorry, I get 30. And there's five, five rows and six columns for 30. And the raw data, there's 30. So I got, I got the right number. I double check and make sure I didn't miss one. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then they're going to ask us, let's see what they ask. Is it roughly normal? <laughs> yeah. Does it look like a bell? Yeah. No, so it's going to be B, C, or D. Okay, no, because they do not start off low. That's the first thing. They got to start off low to go up. So. That's the only one that makes sense. You know, this one says, although the frequencies start low, that's not correct. No, the distribution is approximately symmetric. No, that's not correct either. So it has to be the last one. Okay. All right. That one. Okay. Here's another one like we just did with the. Uh, so now that it's 0.2 volts, right? So it's 126.8. See where I start? I just go. I just use the lower limits, and then I, I, 
I keep adding 0.2, so this will be 127.0, 127.2. And 127.4. So this has to be what? Who's going to tell me what it is? Yeah. It goes to one decimal place. So what's the only number that can go there? Seven. Seven. And then you just have to add two point two. So 126.9. This will be 127.1. Oops, I missed the one there. 127.3. 127.4. Five. And then here's here's once again you got it'll click to view the data and then the double rectangles you can put it in stats. Sometimes they make you do that. I'm gonna close that just to get it out of the way. I'm gonna open this up. Uh, how many are there? Let's see. 25. 25. Yeah, that's what it says. 25. Okay. So I guess you guys like the histogram, so let's stick with mm -hmm. it. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which one I pick. I want to do the, the voltage, right? That's all I really care about. So I'm going to do voltage. I don't care which day it is because we don't have to use that to answer the question. So I'm going to uh, do uh, start at 126.6. Since we can use the lower limits and not worry about the boundaries. What, what would be the boundary here? It'd be the, it'd be the two decimal places, so it'd have to be, let's let's go ahead and do it. Five, five, right? right. All right, then the width was 0.2. There you go. So, it looks pretty uniform, doesn't it? Five, six, four, five, five. Five, Six, four, five, oops. five, six, four, five, five. See, there when you use tab, it goes through all the, all those boxes. Does it appear to be normal? No. No, we already said no because the frequencies. Are roughly equal across the voltage. Okay. If anything, they're uniform. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty uniform. Okay. Close the stat crunch. Uh, Nineteen. All right. So this one. Let's open it up. To see what it says. Now, one of the things here is it's almost impossible to read what that says, so I'm just going to open it up. That's non-filtered, and that's filtered. So you got two, you got two, two frequency tables, but, but the classes are all the same. So this, these, these percentages are for the non-filtered, and these are for the filtered. And you notice I only have five for the non-filtered. And four for the filter. So there's going to be some zeros other than the ones that they're up that are up there. See, by default, seven to ten for the non-filter has to be zero. So let's the other thing is first thing I want to do is add these up. 17 and 8, 25. 17 and 8, 25. So each each one has n equals 25. One twenty-fifth is what percent? How many quarters in a dollar? Four. Four percent. So X equals one, four percent. X equals two, eight percent. X equals three, twelve percent. X equals twenty-five, one hundred percent. Each percent is, is or each each X, each frequency is four percent. Right? Because there's twenty-five total. So each one has to be four percent. See, they made it real nice so you don't gotta use a calculator. You okay with that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give leeway to your your mention that. Okay, so 15 to 18, that's the first one there. It says one, so that's four percent. One twenty-fifth is four percent. One out of twenty-five. The next one's zero, so it's zero percent. 
The next one's 16. 16 times 4, 64%. The next one's 6. 6 times 4, 24%. The next one's 2. 2 times 4, 8%. There's nothing in here. Don't forget to fill those in. So if you add those numbers up, you get 68 and 32 is 100. All right, so now the other one, on the other side, it does start at 7 to 10. There's three of them, so 3 times 4 is 12. 2 times 4 is 8. 7 times 4 is 28. And 13 times 4 is 52. If you add those up, you get 78, uh, I'm sorry, 80, 88, 100. And don't forget, these are all zeros because they don't appear. But they don't appear in the table, the frequency table, so but they're automatically assumed to be zero. We good? Right. Just so just so you just so you know where I got that. Look, one divided by twenty-five, four percent. That's if, if it was twenty-three, I'd have to be rounding off and see they made it nice and simple for us, didn't they? Yeah. Congratulations. All right. So the question is, do, 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 do uh, cigarette filters appear to be effective based on what you see here? This is tar. This is the this is the amount of tar. This is the amount of tar in the cigarette. So th this is less tar with the filtered cigarettes. This is more tar with the non-filtered, right? Non-filtered filters. Can you see that? Right? Non-filtered have more tar, filtered have less tar, so yes, it appears the relative frequency of the higher tar classes is greater for non-filtered cigarettes. Right? Okay, yeah. Make sense? Yeah. All right. You sure? We okay? Well, see, what, this, this is higher tar. There's a higher percentage of the cigarettes that have more tar. Those are the ones that are non filtered. But the filtered cigarettes have less tar. So it appears that filters help out with tar. If that's important, if you, if you know anything about it, they usually make a big deal about tar and nicotine, right? Okay, the last one we want to do here is called a, 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 a cumulative frequency. Just think of accumulating. So it's a running total of, you see what it says, less than 40. Well, less than 40, there's one of them. 35 to 39 is less than 40. See, those are the only ones less than 40, so there's one of them. You accumulate one. Now, less than 45. Well, that's all of those, four plus one. So just add four to the one, you get five. You're accumulating. So all you're doing is adding. What's the next number? Five. So five plus five is 10. What's the next number? Nine. So 10 plus 9 is 19. 19 plus 6, 25. Nine, 25 plus 6, 31. 31 plus 1, 32. The last number should be the total in the whole shooting map because it says less than 70. Well, they're all less than 70, so you just add them up and you should get 32. 5, 10, uh, 19, 25, 31, 32. Everything checked. So that's called a cumulative frequency table. So we have frequency table, relative frequency table, and cumulative frequency table. All right? Yep. That's it for that section. We're going to move on to histograms, which we've already been doing. How about that? So this should be fairly straightforward for us. Oh, okay. The heights of adult males are normally distributed. If a large sample of adult males is randomly selected, and the heights are illustrated in a histogram, what's the shape of the histogram? If they're normally distributed, which one? Uniform? If they're evenly distributed. No, no, it doesn't say. Even, it says they're normally distributed. So then uh, you define it as uniformly distributed. As normal distribution. Don't you remember? 
Are you a type of a human expression of it for those Which ones don't, which one's normal? But wouldn't it be normally distributed? Wouldn't that define it as? No, that's uniform distributed. Normal means bell shaped. Okay. It's just another. A n normal is technically a continuous distribution, but in the, it's bastardizing the language to mean bell shaped. Mm -hmm. So the answer is bell shaped. It's not normal in the sense of usual. Doesn't mean usual or uh, what we what we normally see. Normal is. Normal is this. That's normal. See here they call it the empirical. And the reason the reason normal and empirical you know what empirical means observed. Yeah. It, it starts low, goes high, comes back down low. So the highs in the middle. Empirical means observed. In almost anything that deals with human beings or, or animals or plants, you get a normal distribution, whatever you're measuring. And that's why it's called normal because it happens it's ubiquitous. It, it happens everywhere. I don't care what you measure. If you get a large enough sample, 30 or more, it's going to start to look normal. Okay. If it involves a living type entity, okay. fish, tree, whatever you're measuring on a on a on a, on a, a living entity. Okay, so that's 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 normal. All right, number six. All right. The histogram to the right represents the weights and pounds of members. Now, the problem is, is they don't give us this, the boundaries; they give us the limits. But we're still going to go ahead and use them. So, what would what would you say the class width is for any of the classes? Ten. Ten. That's what, that's the best guess. Because we, we don't really have boundaries; we have we have uh, limits. Okay. What's the approximate lower and upper class limits for the first class? Which is the first class? Right there. So it would be that and that. So 105 and 115 would be the best numbers to use. Okay. I don't like that they don't use boundaries, but you see, we can we can get away with it when we were drawing them too. So they're just they're getting away with it. They're not being really exact. exact. Yes, that's the right word. Okay, so here's here's the here's the, here's the frequency distribution. There's your classes. They want to know which one it is. So normally all you got to do is go to the first one. The first one has a frequency of one. This one has six. Both of these have one. So then we go to the second one. It's four. This one's less than five. This one's greater than it's, it's equal to five. So it has to be this one. So we had to do two tests to see it. So there it is, A. Okay. You see, you can eliminate this one because the first class okay, has frequency of one. This has a frequency of six. This one and this one look like the first class has a frequency of one. So you go to the second class, frequency of four. This line is less than five. This line is equal to five. So this is this is four. Yeah, I, I just blanked out the whole thing right before it. And then right as soon as I check back in, it's going to be hit the center. Now they're going to ask us. See, see they're going to say, does this appear to be normal? And I would still say yes. Starts low, goes high, and comes back low. Although these two technically should be switched. But I think it's close enough to, be, to saying yes. So let's see. Remember before they told us no. Watch, watch what happens here. See, the histogram appears to depict the normal distribution. The frequencies generally, no, that's decreased. 
the D. It appears to be depicted, the frequencies generally increase to a maximum and then decrease. And the histogram is roughly symmetric. So that's the only one that fits. See, so now they're saying it is. Or well, they switch that to order. So you got, you can see how it's it's a matter of, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other something. All right? All right. Next one. So now we don't we don't know which one because we don't see the data. See, we don't have the data. But here, we, if we open, now we got the raw data. So guess what we're going to do? We're just going to go create our own histogram. So we open up the data in StatCrunch. I don't need that. Let's see, I gotta move this over a little bit. Move this over a little bit. Uh, I'll just make it a little small. See if they overlap, then when when you if you don't don't close each other out, so to speak. All right, so I just go to graph histogram. Now service times is what I want. I go down to bins. Start, they all start at 69 and a half. So there you go. That's that's my starting point, 69 and a half. See, this one, they're being really good about using the boundaries. And the width, well, the width is obvious. It's 40. The distance between any two numbers is 40. So 40. And then compute. And so I, what I'll do is I'll just make it a little wider so it looks more like it's A, right? OK, so A. And then they're going to ask us, the histogram, is it roughly symmetric or does it have a left tail or right tail? It has a longer right tail, so the distribution is skewed to the right. All right? It's easy, huh? As long as you've got the raw data, you can use the histogram. If you don't, it's hard to do. I've, I've tried a lot of different ways, and it just doesn't work. That was 11, uh, 13. Okay, so for this one, they gave us the frequency table. We don't have raw data, so we just have to. So we can eliminate B because it starts at 25. We can eliminate C because it starts at 30. So it has to be this one, 25. See, all you got to do is just take the first class and, and figure out that, that A is the answer. And then they'll have a second question. Is, is it is it approximately normal? <laughs> no, it's not symmetric. That's the only one that makes sense there. Okay. You see, it says approximately uniform. No, obviously it has no maximum. That's not true. The first class is the maximum class. And not, or yes, it's approximately normal. Well, it's not normal because it's not bell shaped. So it's skewed right is what it is. And there's one that doesn't start low, it starts high and just goes straight down to the left or to the right. I should so, so. Okay, that was 12. I oh, know. That was 12. Okay. So I'm going to let you guys tell me which one it is. For me, it's pretty obvious. Can you see him? Hey, I heard you both. Good job. So the histogram is as a longer right tail. So once again, it's skewed to the right. Same answer as before, but we didn't know that. See, that was the. Uh... Okay, so now you see these are bar charts. So I can eliminate those because it says. Histogram. So it has to be one of these two. So look, it goes up and it comes down. It's roughly symmetric. So it can't be that one because the first class has one. So it's got to be C. Does it appear to be approximately normal? Once again, even though those last two classes are not, you know, decreasing. I'm going to say yes, it's approximately normal. Because look, it's not at all symmetric. No, that's not true. It is symmetric. It's completely erratic. No, that's not true. It's no, it is approximately uniform. No, that's not true. So it is approximately normal. That's the only one that makes sense. We good with that one? Yeah. Okay. And 
Let's see, that was uh, fourth, fourteen. Wow, we've come to the end of these, except the ones you did. Okay, I got to throw this in. This is this is called a QQ plot. What it does is it compares with something we we don't know yet. It compares the x value with the z value. The z values are the standard score for x value. We standardize them. Uh, we're going to learn about that in a couple of days. But you can read the graph. You can say, did the blue dots line up on the red line? No. So if they do, then it's normal. So, so it's a way to look at a, a normality other than looking at the at the actual data in the histogram. So it's, it's not normal. It's not reasonably close to the straight line. Well, I would find it by a straight line. By what value would that be? Would that be the Z value? The Z value, yeah. The Z That's value. what the Z value should be. Straight to the red line. Yeah. Okay. Given the mean of the standard deviation yeah, for the data, that's where they should be. Okay. Yeah. If they if they were it was perfect, they'd be right on it. Okay. So it's A, it's they're, they're, what would you use that to? Um, well, sometimes you have to you have to make assumptions about the data being normally distributed because it's a small data set, is that and it's important mean? depending on what you're doing. Is that how you would use to um, check if something's misleading? Yeah, it's, it's a QQ plot. If you, if I can show you, I can show you. Look, uh, let's see. There's the data, but they don't they don't give it to us, so I can't put it in stats crunch. But I can show you this. If I open up StatCrunch, I can show you that in the graph graphing section, see down here QQ plot. Mm -hmm. So you can you can you can uh, you can do a QQ plot. Okay. It, it's something we're going to be doing later on. So I'll introduce it now. You can just digest it. Just remember that we, we want to see visually how close we fit to the red line. And also, when we do, when we actually do the QQ plot, we can get what we call a correlation, which I'm going to talk about here before we leave today. A correlation, co linear correlation coefficient, which is another measure of how well. This is called a scatter plot. The blue dots are called a scatter plot. And, and we, what we want to do is measure how close a line can fit through them. In this case, it's, it's the line dictated by the, the normality assumption. And for correlation, it's just a line of best fit. Do they actually form a straight line? So mm -hmm. it's very similar, but we can still talk about correlation that way. It, it, it tells us how, how well it fits, the scatter plot fits to a line. A couple of review questions, and then we'll move on. The height of the bars of the histogram correspond to frequency. Very good. You good? Frequency. The F, frequency. Uh, the bars in the histogram just so you know of equal height doesn't make sense because then they would be totally strictly uniform have unequal width doesn't make sense because you have to have the same width as you do are not labeled no they are labeled <laughs> so <laughs> they're labeled with a frequency that wouldn't have the same, uh, you can't, no, you can't because the classes have to be the same width. You can't, you can't have an histogram without the same width. Not for a linear type of, of, of rendering. And I'm you, sure. Can they do that to like mislead them? Like, is that an easy way to mislead a chart? Or sure, sure. Yeah. Change the... yeah, that's exactly it. Let's see, numbers. Because those meta exact same grade bring in charts and graphs that do not have the same distance. Well, we're going to talk about a couple of those here in a second. What kind of distribution has a bell shape? No. There you go. Okay. So now we're going to move on to, to the next section. 2.3. There's only a couple of questions in here. Graphs at the C. There's a couple of preliminary questions. So I got these body temperatures. There's uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. What is what is it 
why is it that the graph of these data would not be very effective in helping to understand the data? What's the best answer there? Yeah. You say D? D. No. I mean, now I know what number to do or what letter to do. D. It's just a small, the sample's too small. You can't make hydro hair out of 10. I don't care what you do with graph. It's not going to change anything. The point of it is, is it's just too small. Like, but, the, but so, is that the. What they're trying to get you to see is that. Graphs don't correct anything. If you if you have a small sample, they they, they they can't you can't force the issue by making it into something that it isn't. That's all. Okay. Same thing here. If you got a voluntary response, can you do can a graph help to overcome that? Yeah. No. If it's a bad sample, there's no, nothing a graph can do. Graphs only have so, so much power. And now uh, the last two here. These are uh, these are things you're typically you'll see that people do. What do you think's wrong with this one? It says salaries for men and women at col private colleges and universities. What impression do you get when you look at that? Well, yeah, they do make more, but what's what's even more egregious about it? That looks like it's twice as big as that. Right? So it creates the impression that men have salaries that oh, are twice okay. that of women. Right, right. But what's what's the problem with the graph? Why do you think that happened? Because they didn't start where? At zero. At zero. They're both they're starting at fifty thousand. So watch. They don't start at zero. Now what if they did? Which one would you which one would be the correct rendering? D, right? Yeah. See, this one starts at zero, but it has the wrong amount for women. This one doesn't start at zero, so eliminate that. This one starts at zero, and it has the 6,000 for women and a little bit more than 7,000 for men. So, see, that would, be, that would be more accurate. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's twice as much now. That's, that's the problem, deception that people do with graphs. You'll see this all the time. Especially in like magazines, newspapers, uh, political stuff. Okay, look at this one. Is this does the graph distort the data? It says that this is 21.6 and this is 5.9. That's less than this. That should be like three and a half times as big as this, right? Let's let's see what it is. It's like three and a half. Let's let's see. Let's get it exact. If I take 21.9. And divide by 5.6. Yeah, well, it's four times. Okay, so this should be four times the size of that, is it? No, it's like it's like about ten times. It's overwhelmingly huge. It doesn't really make a fair comparison. So, does the graph distort the data? It'd be B or C. Well, yeah, because 3D graph, 3D objects always distort. No, volumes. They're using volumes. Because volumes are 3D. I, I thought about that backwards. Volumes are 3D, and they don't, you, you're putting something that's 3D into 2D re rendering because mm. it's on a paper, piece of paper, okay. but it's supposed to represent a three, three dimensional object, and it, does, it doesn't fare very well. It, it's, un, it's unfair. So, uh, what would be a better uh, graph? Now they, I got a warning, they changed color. The, the red is now blue. <laughs> the A and A go. So which one would be 21.6 and 5.9? It'd be this one. See, this is a more fair representation. The blue is about four times as big as the, as the red. And that's, that's much more fair. So there's a lot of trickery goes on, especially like you see, like I said, newspapers and magazines don't, don't They'll put a picture and say, look at this difference. And whether it's a graph that's cut off at the wrong place or something that's three dimensional, uh, looking like it's two dimensional, then it's unfair. 
Okay, so that's the trickery. And now to end up, we're going to go to section 2.4 and we're going to talk about scatter plots, correlation, and regression. So let me show you what a scatter plot looks like. I think you know what a scatter plot looks like. These are scatter plots. Okay. So what we're dealing with here is bivariate data. We have the data points are ordered pairs in the plane. So you have X and Y are related. So, you know, it could be uh, say if you're if you're out measuring something in the wild, like a, a wild animal, like a bear. You could measure its, its uh, height and its weight. So this would be height and this would be weight. And so like this would be, uh, okay. this would be the ordered pair that signifies for one particular bear. The height would be the X and the, and the weight would be the Y of the ordered pair. And these are all the ordered pairs. Now the question is, how well is a straight line fit that? How, long, how well does a straight line fit that one? Well. Yeah. See how well is a straight line? This is a cloud because there's no straight line that fits this. Yeah. What, what we do is we just take a horizontal line, which is the y, y average, y bar. And this one, there's no a straight line would look like this, but guess what? It's actually a parabola. There's a, so the relationship between x and y is nonlinear, it's parabolic, it's quadratic. So it'd be uh, y is is something in terms of x squared because it looks like a parabola. Remember from algebra, y equals x squared is parabola. Right. So it's nonlinear, but it still has a linear uh, correlation coefficient. So the linear correlation coefficient is, is something as a measure that's, that you calculate. I'll show you the calculation. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, intense. There it is. Are we going to have to do it? No. Okay. no. The calculator does everything. Okay. okay. Now, this is this is the format for calculation. This is for understanding. What we, what we do is we take the product of the z-score, the standard score for each uh, each number in the ordered pair, and we take the sum of all those products, we divide by one less than how many there are, and that gives us uh, the linear correlation coefficient R. Now that's a statistic. R is a statistic. It's the sample correlation coefficient. Linear R is the sample linear correlation coefficient. And that's how you measure it for all the data points. You, take, you know, what this means is the sum of the products. Of the x y's times how many there are minus the sum of all the x's times the sum of all the y's blah blah blah. So if you could, the calculator does all this. It does it like that, and it gives us this value r. The r is the sample. Well, rho, which looks like a t. Rho is the lowercase Greek r. Rho r h r, and rho is the population. Linear correlation corpus. So we, we use R to estimate rho. And what we do, which we're going to do toward the end of the class, but I'll show you now, we create a hypothesis. We say rho is equal to zero, which means it's a cloud. There's no correlation. And that's what we call the null hypothesis. We say that's our assumption. And then we, we our alternative is that rho is different than zero, meaning that if R is, is big enough, then we can we can negate that and say this is true that there is a correlation. If we can if we can show that R is big enough, then we can say there's a linear correlation. Well, R R only goes between two numbers, plus one and minus one. That's all. That's 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 the extent of how far it travels. And if I show you back to those two, those four uh, 
fixtures. You can see that this one looks pretty good. There's a straight line. It's called the line of regression, line of best fit. It fits that'll what it does is it minimizes the sum of all the vertical distances from itself between the line. Right? And the line that does that is called the line of best fit. And this is a measure of how well it fits. So the reason it's negative is because it has a negative slope. When R is negative, you have a negative slope. When R is positive, you have a positive slope. When R is close to zero, you got no slope, which is this horizontal line. You see? That's how it works. So zero is in the middle. And what we do is we depending depending on see there's critical values for R, critical values. And these depend CDRs depend on N and what we call alpha. Alpha is alpha, which is the uh, uh, level of significance, which I told you yesterday was typically 5%. So alpha is usually 5%, although sometimes it could be 1%. It all depends on the, on the, uh, you know, how significant you want to make your, but typically it's 5%. So typically 5%. So what happens is there's a we don't calculate it, they're just given to us. We calculate the CVs and they're they're uh, opposites. So you got a plus CVR and a minus CVR. And if we end up in the middle, guess what? There's no correlation. We're in, we're not significant enough. But if we end up in the tail, then here we have a, a significant positive correlation. We end up here, we have a significant negative correlation. R, when the value of R is in here. See, these, these are opposites, and they're, they're, uh, they're the same number, just opposites. And, and we can find those by table, or they'll give them to us. That's, that's typically the one way we'll do it. So once again, this will be perfect correlation with this positive slope. That means all of the all of the all of the scatter plot dots are on the line precisely. There's no variation. They're all on the line. And this one would be negative slope. They're all on the line. And you can see that it's hard to get to plus one. You can get fairly close or minus one. What this what this is telling us that's a really good fit. This is a fairly good fit. You can see that a little bit less less solid. And this is there's no fit. That's Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through how we use this. So let's start with any questions so far? Did we do no. two, four, one? Okay, no, we didn't. In this section, we'll use R to denote the linear correlation coefficient. Why do we refer to this correlation coefficient as being linear? Because it's, it's a measure of how close the scatter plot fits a straight line. So it is the distance. Is R representing the max distance from the line or the average distance from the line? The minimum. Minimal. Minimum of the total distance. Okay. The term linear refers to straight line, and R measures how well a scatter plot fits a straight line pattern. That's what it does. Okay. All right. Number two. Can you have I can you have a one? Sure. Okay. That's a perfect fit. Yeah. That's why. That's why I left. That's if you I'm have. Sure. A, that's if you have all the points on a straight line. Okay. And it's, it's one. If we find that there's a linear correlation between the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and the global temperature, does that indicate that changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide cause changes in the global temperature? Simple yes or no. So if two things are correlated, is there a cause between them? No. 
Okay. If they're correlated, there's a positive way to bring the thing up. But not necessarily each other. No, no, but there is a possible. But not necessarily each other. No, but they're correlated. They're correlated, but they're not correlated causal, to each other. causally related. Yeah. They're just correlated. They either both go up together or they go opposite directions. If they're positively correlated, they go up and down together. If they're negatively correlated, they go opposite directions. One goes up, the other goes down. But just because they're correlated doesn't mean that there's a causation. One doesn't cause the other. It's likely there's a third, per, a third or fourth. Yeah, it would have to be a third party that would cause. Sure, but they don't cause each other. You can't make that assumption. It's, a, it's, it's one of the first rules in, in correlation. Correlation does not mean causation. Does it not imply? I'll give you a good story. My first statistics class at graduate school at Ohio State, my teacher was Elizabeth Stasner, Stash professor. And she had done work the previous summer at the dairy farm, Ohio State dairy farm. They had dozens, scores, maybe hundreds of cows. And they wanted to, they wanted to do a, a regression, a correlation analysis on what, if they could pinpoint what helped uh, what was what was what was highly correlated with uh, milk fat? Right. Milk fat. Milk fat. Okay. And uh, they put all the data in for all these cows, and they came back with an amazing result for one of the okay. variables. But they, they did a multiple regression. Okay. We're only doing a, a simple uh, linear regression between two variables, but you could do it with a whole bunch of explanatory variables. Anyway. When they looked at the explanatory variable that was highly correlated with the uh, dairy fat, it was the cow's ID number. So it's a nothing. Yeah, so the joke was, well, why don't we just give them better numbers? Yeah. See, if you, if you think causation and correlation are related, then that's, that's the, that's the, that gums up the works. So don't, never get, never fall for that. Never true. Uh, you know, in the old, in the colonial days, the number of ministers went up with the cons same as the uh, uh, consumption of rum. Both went up. Did one cause the other? Yeah. Oh, there's more people. More people needed more ministers. More people drank rum. It had nothing to do with each other. It's just that they both went up together. But something else caused it. They didn't cause each other. So. You got to be real careful with that, okay? Just a word of warning. What is a scatter plot? How does it help us? Okay, so we did it. The scatter plot is a table of paired x, y values. Uh, it just it, it's what it provides an organized display which helps to show patterns. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Let's go back to it. Help show any patterns in there. I read the wrong one. It's it's just it's a visual image of the, of the data points. That's what a scatter plot is. Okay, so here we go. We got four scatter plots, and they're going to give us the raw data, and we have to figure out which one's which. Now we don't want to have to calculate these. Okay, so it's president's height on the x, opponent's height on the y. Are they correlated? So we take open the raw data. Just like before, when we did before. There's the double ones. We open the stat crunch. And they're not going to be correlated to. I don't need that. Uh, so I'm going to make this smaller. So there's the X and Y data. X is our president's height, Y is our opponent's height. They're paired. So we can put those in a plot. Watch, I'll show you the plot. Here's how we do it we go to stat, regression, simple linear. We tell it what the X's are. The X's are the presidents, the Y's are the opponents. And that's it. That's all you got to do. We're going to use some of this later on. But right now, that's all you got to do. And we hit compute. And I like to hit this X here and make it bigger. Now, this is, I'll explain some of this later, but we, right now, we want, I hit the right button, and there's our plot. That's the scatter plot. All those 20 data points, there they are, the blue, the blue dots. And there's our regression line. That, that formula, 
It put all the information in it. That's the line that it drew. And it also gives us R. But for, we'll talk about that later. So which one is it? You think it's A? Sounds good. Because you got these two dots down here match up with these two dots right there, right? I was looking at the computation of it. Okay. Whatever, whatever. You might have to take, do one or two uh, perusals, but that's A. Okay. Now, does there appear to be a correlation? No. No, because look, the line is flat. It's it's a snowball. It's a scatter. It's it's a Would snowstorm. Would you be able to tell if there's a correlation based off of what screen? Well, you can't always do that. It depends on the size of the data. But now when we go back here, you can see where R is. Now they use a capital R here. I don't know why. Here's your correlation coefficient. You can see it's 0 0.098. Yeah, so less than. That's real point. small. And then the other thing is you do. Uh, that's not good. But that, that'll tell us what we need to know. 0 0.098. So no. Well, what's not good? What's that? What's not good? What's not good? You said something wasn't good. Uh, I just looked at, I looked at this number. Kind of small. It, it shouldn't be small. So I'm going to answer no. Is that we, we just look at the scatter plot? That's called the p value. We're going to talk about that later, and uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it's so uh, low. But anyway, here here is the uh, line of regression. You know that red line, straight line. There it is. Y equals. Now, in statistics, it's different from algebra. Remember, in algebra. We write y equals mx plus b, slope y-intercept, yeah. straight line. Remember this? <laughs> Do you have the prerequisites for this one? Yeah, uh, well, because uh, I graduated, um, I graduated from high school in 1990. Okay. Now, it's, this is for math. In statistics, we write y equals b naught plus b one x. They change the names and the order. B becomes b naught. That, that's a zero. It just pronounce it b naught. That's just the that's the b naught h t b naught. Oh, okay. So you're saying naught a o t. No, b naught. This is b one. This is f. So they give them different names, but it's still a, it's still the it's still the linear uh, line of best fit called the regression line. So there's y opponent's height. This is b naught. This is the intercept. This is the this is the slope. That's b one. And there's president's height. That's x. So instead of writing y and x, they write they write them out. There's x and there's y. So you got y equals b naught plus b one x. Sample size, I said 20, it was, there's 16 ordered pairs. That's SM, sample size. And the correlation coefficient should be little r, but they use, you gotta bear with it. They use capital R, so we gotta bear with it. And, oh, I was looking at the wrong P. That, that, this P value is really high. See, this is much greater than 5%. Right. That's 71, that's almost 72%. That tells us, we're not anywhere near any tails. Okay. That tells us we're in the middle. That tells us that there's no correlation. We can't, we can't. Uh, Would 0 0.71 be on the right there? Is the next thing? No, that's a p-value. The, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.098. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. 0 0.098 is about right here. Yeah. It's one-tenth. This is plus one, so it's gotcha. one. Yeah. What the p-value does, uh, you'll see before we're done with, with the class, the p-value measures the area to the right of, the, of, of something. It's, I'm sorry. But I was looking at the wrong one. The 716 is the one you want to look at. It's the slope one. The intercept one is your okay, I got you. The slope one. 
So the p-value we're going to look at later, and we'll, we'll just compare it to 5%. But we can do it either way. We can do it by looking at the, at the, at the we can tell that there's, there's no correlation. There's no straight line of death fit. What, what this line does is it minimizes all the, the total of all these. Look how many are above and how many are below it. It, it equalizes. And the only way it can equalize is to go flat. So if they ask us what's the best fit, we would say the average of the Ys. And how do we how do we find the average of the Ys? We go to the Ys are the opponent type, right? So we would we would go to uh, stat uh, summary stat column opponent type, and here's all the summary stats which we're going to use starting on Thursday, and we would compute, and there's the mean. So we would say the best guess is, is y equals 185. That's the average. And we, we get all these other values that we're going to talk about some more as going forward. So you can see, I, I'm trying to show you that we don't have to do a lot of calculations. We just have to be able to interpret. Okay. That was uh, number five. Let's see number six. So now, once again, once again, what we want to do is open this up in StatCrunch, and why do I have to sign in again? I just this is the one. I just start clicking the data set under data. Where? No, that's something different. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on here. It just says checking login credentials, but it's not letting me log in. I just, I've been doing it all the evening. Right? This is pretty stupid, huh? Let's try a different problem. Maybe it's that problem. We'll try seven. All right, so what I got to do then is uh, just I got to just uh, come back. Sometimes it just gets locked up in itself, you know, these computers. Let's see if it works. Oh, man. This is frustrating. There might be too many people who are using a hiding program within Pearson, overloading it, not allowing it to load it under the big sets of new users. Could be. See, it's, it's, it does that sometimes, but it usually goes right, right to where it has to go. I'm already signed in, and you know who I am. Let's see if there's a way around this.
me try something real quick here. The, uh, gosh darn it. Sorry about that. That's the first time this ever happened to me. There's another way I can do this. Uh, for staff disk, it'll be a different software that I can hopefully show you. Okay, so I have the data in staff disk. It's a, it's it's a, almost the same. It's just slightly different. So I'm going to do correlation regression. Uh, So there's our scatter plot. Does so which one? If yep. you have, um, which one is it? The B. Uh, B. The G, does it B? Really matter too much on um, being able to say correlate if you have like those big gaps in between the uh, dots? What do you mean? Point? So between. That top one and that next closest one is a massive gap. Yeah, but it's what it is is the minimization of the vertical distances. Okay. The green line fits fits through the blue dots fairly well. Right. Uh, now you can see it gives you some of the similar things. Uh, R where is it? Of an RF mod and your critical RF is not. Yeah, there it is. See, it's minus, it's pretty close to minus one exactly. Yeah. It's the P value C is zero, means it's much less than five percent. So everything points to the fact that it's a good fit. So we go back to the uh, is there a linear relationship? Yeah. Uh, as as the weight increases, the mileage decreases because it's a negative. Mm. One goes up, the other goes down. So the weight of the car goes up, mileage decreases. So I, I wasn't able to use StatCrunch, but you can see I, almost any any uh, any editor will work. I just have to be able to get the data into it. The problem is, is I can't get the data into StatCrunch. It won't let me. So. Uh, Let's try it again. We'll do the next question. Oh, maybe we don't need to. Oh, okay. So now we're going to talk about those CDRs. It says for the data set of brain volumes and IQ scores of 11 males, so M is 11, the linear correlation coefficient is 0.115. That's pretty low. It says use the table available to find the critical values of R. So those are the CDRs, critical values of R. So if I click on that, it'll give me values of n from 4 to 12. So 11, remember now they're, they're opposites, so it's 0.602, it's plus or minus 0.602. So those are the critical values. So I go plus or minus 0.602. How do you, you know that there's a number 11? Because it said there's 11, 11 men. Oh, uh, okay. So, so now on, on here, so this is plus 6.02, and this is minus 0.602. 
and point one one five is between them. It's in the middle. So it's between the critical values, not in the tails. So since the correlation coefficient is between the critical values, there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. The claims down here. If I can't reject this, I can't go down here. So this is what we believe, all things being equal, unless we can show that we're in the tail. If we can show we're significant in either side, then we reject this and we support this. Because that's always the claim. The claim is that there is uh, a correlation, which means that rho is equal to, it's not equal to zero. Because if rho is equal to zero, that means you're in here. See, it's hypothetically zero, but you're close enough to relatively to zero to say you're not out here. So you can't support this. The point. Oh. What is, uh, if it's linear, does rho equal zero or not equal zero? Uh, that's just the claim. Rho equals zero means you're in here. Okay. That's just the point estimate. Being equal to zero is the same as being close enough to zero for all intents and purposes. In this case, being equal to zero is being between these two numbers. Okay. Yeah. Being not being equal to zero is being here or here. It's just that depending on this, depending on n and, and 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 alpha, these these critical values shrink or get bigger and 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 make you know make the interval of correlation of significance smaller or larger depending on it all depends on m and for this one it's five percent so alpha is set at five percent yeah critical values are always plus or minus because they're two-sided right because you go between one, minus one and plus one on the scale uh let me show you that let me show you that also Thing's losing its mind. It's losing its mind. All right, so let's just go ahead. We can talk about this the next time. Uh, check the answer if it's correct. They're going to give us another one. For a data set of chest sizes around the Distance around the chest at inches and weights of pounds of four and that's the size bears that were measured. The linear correlation is R equals 0.992. That's pretty high. Use the table. Okay, so the critical values is what they want. So N equals four, so it's 0 0.950 plus or minus. So plus or minus 0 0.950. So you see that because, because there's only four bears, now it's 0 0.950 and minus 0 0.950. It got bigger. This, this is a small space. But guess where we ended up? 0.993. That's where we're at. We're in the right tail. 993, yeah. So we can, we can reject the null because we have evidence that takes us outside of the zero area. See, the zero area shrinks or gets big depending on M. With n equals four, you can't have a small area because you, you, there's not a lot of evidence. So you, your evidence has to be really good. And 0.993 is really good. Okay, so that's excellent. And then since the correlation coefficient is to the right tail, see, it's in the right tail above the positive critical value. In other words, 0.993 is greater than 0 0.950. We're in the right tail. And there is significant evidence, sufficient evidence to support the claim. Because this is the claim. I didn't write that, but this is the claim. That there is a correlation. It's just that the way it's set up, the only way to prove the claim is to, is to reject the fact that, it, that the correlation is zero. And the only way to do that is to end up in a tail. It's just, the, it's just how they set up the test. It's, it's, it's the pro forma, it's how, it's how it's done. So when you have a smaller sample size, you get a you bigger, get a bigger, bigger uh, zero area. Okay. I mean, 0.95 is really a pretty big number, Correct. but not for size n equals four. Mm -hmm. 
you can see that if you look at that table, yeah. that as, as n gets bigger, okay. CV goes down, you get smaller zero area. We're allowing more more room for a for a, for a coefficient to work. Okay. Yep, that's how it works. And now this is all based on previous attempts at how to do this. You know, over time, this is what they've come up with. Okay. This is one. That's okay that we ran out of. Here, here's the p-value one. Just for that data set with brain volumes and IQ scores of 11 males, that same one, the linear correlation coefficient was found to be 0 0.324. Write a statement that inter interprets the p-value. So this is the p-value. So the p-value is 32.4 percent. If I turn that decimal into a, a percent, it's 32.4, right? Move the decimal place two places to the right. Okay, which is high. It's greater than five percent. Remember, alpha five percent, alpha the level of significance five percent is what we rely on, unless we're told otherwise. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that there's a linear correlation. Okay. And one more, fifteen. Now it says the p-value is 0 0.038. So now it's 3.8 percent. Well, obviously 3.8 is less than five. So we say that's low, right? Because it's less than five, so it's low. So there is sufficient evidence to conclude that there's a linear correlation. Because now we're in the tail. Yep, we're significant. So we're. We're going to see a lot of these things as we go uh, forward, p-values and critical values. We'll, we'll talk about them in context. Tomorrow we're going to start on, or Thursday, we're going to start on levels, um, excuse me, measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, and mid-range. And we're going to also look at z-scores. And and that'll be homework three. So you guys are good for homework one and two. You know, I wouldn't wait. Everything's fresh in your mind. You want to get it, do it when it's fresh. Absolutely. You, if you just load it up, it's like RAM memory in your computer. You only have so much space, unless you're superhuman. Any questions? No. Any questions? No, no, no. Uh, we were worried that you weren't going to show up. Sure. Yeah. Oh, here we go.